All right, so today I'm gonna to share with you the reasoning behind why I program in four hour sessions. And this is like four hours, no break, no nothing, just four hours straight programming. And this may seem like a lot to some people and to some people it might seem like that's nothing. And to me, I've spent a lot of time trying to optimize this and trying to get like the optimal kind of balance between productivity and also rest and recovery. And to me, it just seems like four hours has been the optimal time limit for me. And a lot of people right now are proponing something very different to this, which is like the Pomodoro technique, which is super popular. And that's where you essentially study or you work for like 45 minutes or something like that. And then you spend a short amount of time like resting, you take a short break and then you come back to it and you do it again. So I figured it'd be interesting to share why I essentially do the opposite and how I'm able to get more output by doing that. Work is a sprint, not a marathon. I think that most of us actually work better in terms of sprints and not marathons. And that's why I also think that most of us are familiar with the concept of like the night before phenomenon, which is our like unique ability to somehow write an entire essay the night before it's due. And which is why I also think that very few of us are part of the other group, which is the, I studied a little bit every day for the exam group. Okay, so that was kind of a joke. That's not actually the reason why I choose my approach. I think it's generally better to study a little bit every day than it is to just cram the night before the exam or essay is due. But what I'm trying to get at is just our like unique ability to seemingly like muster this superhuman ability to focus and get work done the night before the exam or the essay is due. That's why I like to sit down for extended periods of time doing just one thing. I push hard for a short burst and then I take a longer rest and recover. The way to be the most productive is to work in terms of sprints. And that's because task switching is a huge drain on your energy and output. If you're constantly switching tasks, you end up not making much progress on anything. The better way to approach it is to double down on one thing at a time and spend a significant amount of time doing only that thing. And that is how you make progress. And this is where we get to the flow state, which is a term that's become really popular lately. And this is something that in my experience, it's easier to get to a flow state if you have a lot of time to do it in, and you wanna to get to that state in order to perform really well. Being in a flow state essentially means that you're on a roll on whatever you're working on, that you're hyper-focused on it to the point where doing it feels effortless. And that is what I wanna achieve anytime I work on something. And it's also a state that I wanna maintain for as long as possible. And this means that I will at all costs costs avoid any context switching. As soon as I need to switch context to work on something new, then I know that I will lose the flow state and have to try to get back to it with this new thing, which is really difficult. The Pomodoro technique is more like a marathon in the sense that you're working for just a short amount of time and then you take a short break and then you work for another short amount of time and then you take a short break. So it's more sustainable in that sense. But to me, it just never really seems to work that well because I always seem to end up in like one of two places. And the first one is that right as I'm about to get into the rhythm of my work and like into some sort of like flow state, that's when the alarm goes off and I need to take a break. So I kind of have to interrupt my flow of working for that break and then I go on that break and then when I come back it's always a struggle of like trying to get back to that state because that takes a little bit of time. And the second place that I end up in is the place of like going on that break and then struggling to actually stop the break which is all about willpower but it's still something that's like an unnecessary risk in my opinion. And so for me, it seems like that's what usually happens with the Pomodoro technique is that I always end up having to take a break right as I'm about to reach some sort of flow state. To me, that kind of seems like telling a little kid to not eat candy, but every 45 minutes, they need to go into a candy store and smell the candy for five to 10 minutes it doesn't really make any sense. My approach is instead to work in bursts of energy. I sit down to do one clearly defined task and I allocate enough time for that task to really get it done. Four hours is just a neat number, but it can be two hours or three hours as well. Whatever I need to get the task done. So if you need to work on a feature that you're not inspired to work on, then don't think about that, but just sit down at your desk and open everything up that you need in order to work. Usually thinking about starting is where we lose time. We think about the effort that it will take to start the computer up or open up the text editor. And while you're thinking about how much effort it will take to do what you should do, time just runs away. All of a sudden you've spent two hours not really doing anything but procrastinating on what you were meant to do, which means you've actually wasted your free time. 
So you wanna avoid accidentally wasting your time. And since time is money, as I say, you also wanna start using today's video sponsor, Privacy, to avoid accidentally losing your money by getting your credit card information stolen. Right now, we're all probably doing most of our shopping online, and I think this is only going to increase as more and more things become digital. And a really important thing to keep in mind here is to make sure that your banking information stays secure. Privacy lets you buy things online using virtual cards instead of your real ones, protecting your identity and bank information on the internet. Right now, new customers will automatically get $5 to spend on their first purchase. So go to privacy.com cal to sign up now. Because of privacy, I no longer need to run the risk of accidentally entering my banking info into a sketchy site, I can simply use one of Privacy's virtual cards. It's super easy to set up and has military grade encryption and they do not sell your information. Privacy makes their money from merchants, which allows their service to be completely free for you to use. Plus, they've now added an account summaries feature, which makes it easier for you to create, track and stick to your New Year's resolution budgets. So go to privacy.com cal and get $5 to spend on your first purchase. So this is a little bit sneaky because procrastination is actually spending your free time. So what procrastination essentially is, is undeliberate spending of your free time. Because when you're sitting around and you're like postponing that thing that you need to do and you're sitting around just wasting your time, trying to muster up the energy to actually start working on whatever it is you need to do, you're actually spending your free time. Which leads me to my next point. Thinking about what you would actually want to do with this time if you could do anything can be a great motivator. If you're sitting around trying to build up the momentum to start working on what it is you're meant to, then you're most likely sitting on your phone doing some mindless activity as time is just ticking on. You're essentially using up your free time. So a really useful trick here that I tend to use is that I try to think of like, what would I rather be doing here if I knew this was my free time? So if I had originally planned for this hour or to to be free time what would I really want to be doing and I find that I usually come up with a lot better answers than just like mindlessly scroll through Instagram which is usually what I do when I procrastinate and so those answers usually help me actually motivate me to get back to work because I find this list this long list of things that I would want to do with my free time if I'd planned it and so that kind of motivates me to actually get to free time, so to work now so that I can have that free time to actually spend on those things that I really want to be doing. You're reframing it so that instead of procrastinating on work, you're actually wasting your free time, which makes getting started quite urgent, since the sooner you start, the sooner you'll be done, and thus the sooner you can get to doing that long list of stuff that you really want to be doing. So to me, it seems like the main thing that we want to avoid is procrastination. And the way to do that, I think, is to work on less things with less interruptions. And that way you kind of spend less time in a place where procrastination can occur. And this is something that's of course like over oversimplified by me right now, but it is something that I try my hardest to achieve. And the way that I try to do that is by like eliminating things or steps that I know to be distractions. So I try to put myself almost on autopilot when I'm doing something. I'm, if I know I need to work on a certain file on the computer, I will just m try to like mindlessly or on autopilot, just go to the computer, start it up, open up the file, sit down and just try not to think about those things. A really good example here is actually something that I found very recently, which is that w at nighttime when I'm about to brush my teeth, I usually, that usually takes me a long time to do because one of the main distractions that I run into is the mirror. I usually go into the bathroom and I look myself in the mirror and I'm, I'm like trying to check for different like pimples or whatever. And I spend a lot of time actually doing that. And so a trick that I used was to just open up the, cause we have like mirror doors. So we just, I just opened them up so I didn't see my face. And that way, when I went into the bathroom, I just basically took out the floss and started flossing and like brushed my teeth. So that was like a really simple hack, but that's one example of how you can try to eliminate things that you know can be distractions for you. And that's a really good way to do it. And that's like 90% of avoiding procrastination. It's just, just do it and try to avoid these like distractions that you run into. The other part is to plan ahead. Marques Brownlee or MKBHD actually did an interview with Mark Zuckerberg not too long ago where he asked him like how he divides his time up between the different companies that he runs. And Mark actually explained that he will usually dedicate entire days to different companies. 
So that's like instead of doing something where you'd spend like an hour in the morning working on Facebook and then two hours working on Instagram and then take a break for an hour and then four hours on WhatsApp and then another hour on Facebook. Instead of doing that, he dedicates an entire day to just WhatsApp which to me makes a lot of sense. This is a really useful technique because then you have clear boundaries. If you said that you should work on WhatsApp today, then anything that isn't WhatsApp isn't something that I should work on today. So it's easy to figure out what to focus on and you don't have to switch between lots of different contexts. You can stay focused on a single problem in a single context and make a lot more progress on that. I would also assume that Elon Musk is doing something similar with all the companies that he's running. I try to apply a similar concept with the idea being that I want to avoid task switching as much as possible. Again, relating back to the first point about working in sprints instead of marathons, I sprint for one day working on one thing, the next day I can switch to something else. And by doing this, I feel like I can make a lot more progress on each of the things that I'm working on. And the way that I do this is that every Sunday I will look through my to-dos and figure out what I should do this coming week. This weekly plan is fairly rough and minimal. I try to plan only the things that I absolutely must do because the week will inevitably change the plan. But having a rough outline of what I am going to do each day will allow me to actually reduce the mental energy that I need to put into thinking about what I need to do. It also means that I don't need to worry about missing something important. Throughout the week, I will then revise my plan. I will look at what has changed and what I need to update. So each day I will sit down in the evening and I will look at what I got done today and what I need to push until tomorrow. And then I will look at what I had originally planned to do tomorrow and I will see what I need to change about that. And that's something that's actually really important because a lot of times the week will change and your plans will inevitably change because things just get in the way and just things don't work out the way that you'd planned. And so it's really good to have that original structure of the week to go off of, and then you can just kind of revise things as you go along, as you see what has worked and what didn't work. And then hopefully the next week, you'll be better prepared to plan out that week more realistically. And then the more you do that, the better weeks you'll be able to plan. But usually what will happen is that something that you did today will make tomorrow's to-do list obsolete or something that you thought you needed to do tomorrow actually needs to be done today. So sitting down in the evening the day before is really actually very useful. But don't over plan. Planning can feel rewarding and productive, but it's sometimes a dopamine trap. What I mean here is that sometimes we over plan and I do this a lot. Like I've made this mistake so many times it's like sitting down and planning each hour out throughout the day. So like, okay, in the morning, I'm gonna spend two hours working on this and then I'm gonna have a one hour break to eat or to watch something. And then I'm gonna spend two hours doing this or doing that. And what will usually happen is that your day will change or you won't actually uh, stick to that schedule perfectly, which means that you'll go over by half an hour or something. And then all of a sudden you're stuck in this state of like you're trying to catch up to your own schedule, uh, which is a schedule that you set for yourself. So it's not actually super important, but that's usually what ends up happening for me. And that's why I think it's very important to try to limit how detailed you are about your plans. Usually what happens during the days is that the day gets in your way, which means that sticking to an exact hourly schedule is not always possible. And in fact, I think it's less possible than it is possible. I like structure in my days, but there's also a balance. Often we don't really know how long it will take us to write an essay. And so planning out how much time you will spend on doing that is not really going to be very effective. However, creating a rough structure for your day can actually be really good. For instance, making sure that you start work working at a certain time and allocating a big time slot for working can be really good. For instance, let's say that you start working at eight, then allowing time between eight and 12 of uninterrupted working can be something to put into a schedule. Scheduling, I think, should remain fairly unspecific, allowing as many long periods of uninterrupted work as possible, but not specifying what you should get done. So anyway, a clear schedule is a clear mind and uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you want to, you can subscribe, I would. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope I'll see you in the next one.